Welcome to Chapter 10, Ethics and Law. The four tenets derived from Western philosophical thinking are at the root of virtually every ethical consideration in healthcare. Autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. Virtually every ethical consideration in healthcare emanates from one or more of these tenets. To a noteworthy degree, these tenets also serve as the foundation for many of the legal requirements that apply to healthcare providers and organizations. The tenets should be the guideposts that lead decision makers to make ethically sound decisions. Autonomy. Having respect for another is a critical ethical touchstone. Autonomy means to respect the person and his or her capacity to make informed decisions. It also means a commitment to truth-telling. Patients can only be autonomous effectively if they know the truth. Autonomy also means treating communications with them and information about them confidentially. And finally, it means the relationship should be treated with fidelity, meaning that you will be faithful to the other person. This means keeping your commitments and being accurate with your facts as they relate to others. Non-maleficence. There is an adage in healthcare, particularly for physicians, but it relates to administrators as well. First, do no harm. An administrator mentor of mine once told me that administrators uh, are different than uh, physicians, although we are both healthcare providers, uh, but different in the fact that physicians treat patients one at a time and administrators are treating populations of people at a time. That every decision that an administrator makes or doesn't make doesn't just affect one person, but affects a population of people. It is an awesome responsibility. Clearly, if the patient is seeking care, the notion to avoid doing harm to them is instinctive. It also means taking a reasonable risk if the patient has provided informed consent in advancing care. In a broad sense, this dictate means that one should avoid doing those things that might damage a relationship. Beneficence. This duty extends beyond non-maleficence to create a positive duty to do all one can to aid patients. In addition, it means being charitable and kind to others. The manager has a duty to treat all patients with beneficence. Likewise, the alert administrator always approaches other stakeholders with this standard. This concept also weighs the benefit of an action against the harm caused by not taking it, which means one should do what is in the best interest of those involved. And lastly, justice. The concept of justice speaks to the allocation of resources. How are scarce resources distributed? Are patients treated equally, equitably? What is the difference? Are more funds dedicated to those who are sicker than those who have slightly better health? Does the organization make resources available to treat patients without means in the same fashion as patients who are insured or can pay directly for the care they receive? The answers to these questions help illustrate the concept of justice. We often classify the ethical principles applied to clinical practice in terms of rights and duties, the rights every person holds and the duties we have towards others. The four tenets certainly do not encompass the entire field of clinical ethics, nor are they a conclusive list of ethical principles for healthcare professionals. However, these foundational principles are considered the most pertinent to clinical practice and we can see how they guide many key aspects of a healthcare provider's job. Autonomy, provide informed consent and privacy. Non-maleficence, ensure a safe environment for care. Beneficence, provide competent care. Justice, treat all patients equitably. Clinical care providers are not the only ones who need to think about ethics. Even managers and other professionals who do not directly provide patient care still have ethical responsibilities to patients, colleagues, organizations, and society. 
The four ethical principles of organizational ethics for healthcare organizations and managers include provide care with compassion, treat employees with respect, act in a public spirit, and spend resources reasonably. Slightly reworded, these principles provide the framework uh, regarding uh, the managerial ethics in healthcare, excellence in patient care, respect for employees, corporate citizenship, and the good stewardship of resources. Confidentiality of health information is an essential component of excellence in patient care. Confidentiality goes beyond simply following the laws governing the use and release of information and limiting access to patient information to authorized individuals only and extends to providing the organizational resources, including personnel, hardware, software, policies and procedures that are needed to safeguard confidential information. Providing excellent care with compassion, competency and trust depends on an environment in which patients have the knowledge, ability and right to govern their lives. It is care that respects their decisions. Healthcare organizations and individual providers have all acknowledged an ethical responsibility to participate in quality improvement, or QI. QI is defined as systematic data-guided activities designed to bring about immediate improvements in healthcare delivery in particular settings. Organizational politics uh, are actions that are inconsistent with accepted organizational norms designed to promote self-interest and are taken without regard for and even at the expense of organizational goals. Higher levels of absenteeism, turnover intentions, anxiety, and stress are likely to occur when employees have this perception of organizational politics. Furthermore, these, those views correspond to lower levels of job satisfaction, job performance, and organizational citizenship. Organizations are expected to be good corporate and community citizens. As participants in a democratic society, organizations have a duty to obey the laws concerning issues such as employment, pollution, taxes, and building codes. Healthcare is one of the most complex, transaction-intense, highly regulated industries in the nation. As such, healthcare organizations must comply with federal, state, and local laws regarding licensure, privilege to practice, staffing, continuing education, physical plant safety, the safeguarding of information, and disposal of medical waste, just to name a few. Corporate citizenship also goes beyond adherence to mere legal requirements and speaks to the level of charity care and engagement in the community at large. As healthcare becomes more competitive, economic incentives blur. Healthcare organizations must walk the tightrope between financial success and living their mission and values. Some might naively say there isn't a choice. Healthcare organizations must serve patients and stakeholders. However, a more sophisticated understanding of the business of healthcare shows a delicate balance often stated as no margin, no mission. It is also important to remember that money is not an organization's only resource. Healthcare organizations, other resources include employees, time, physical plant, talent, knowledge, skill, and community goodwill. Not only must a healthcare organization use its financial resources wisely, but it also must leverage all its resources for the greatest benefit to the organization and stakeholders. EMTALA is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act of 1986. It applies to hospitals. And EMTALA was created to address the concern of patient dumping, uh, the refusal to treat uninsured patients and instead transferring them to charitable, ho charitable hospitals 
without uh, having them seen or receiving care. Previously, common law in many states held physicians and healthcare organizations under no obligation to treat any person seeking care. And so to prevent patient dumping, EMTALA requires hospitals and their affiliated physicians to screen and continue to treat emergency patients until they are stabilized or transferred. While EMTALA clarifies the hospital's duties to patients in need of emergency care, the hospital's obligation to provide care in non-emergency situations is less clear. For example, a hospital may decline to provide care if it does not have adequate facilities or providers. In addition, a hospital may require that patients be admitted by an attending physician who is a member of the hospital's medical staff. Finally, once a patient has been accepted and treated, a contract is implied. A hospital or provider may not simply stop treating the patient without risking liability for an abandonment. So whether or not under uh, the dictates of EMTALA, healthcare organizations and providers have the duty to maintain complete, accurate, and timely medical records for all treated patients. The medical record is more than just documentation of the care and treatment provided. Medical records are used to review the appropriateness of care, to provide information for billing, and as a data source for medical research. The medical record is often seen as a legal document and it may be used as evidence in malpractice cases or other legal proceedings. Medical records must be confidential, secure, current, authenticated, legible, and complete. In addition to the obligation to maintain medical records, hospitals are responsible for keeping all patient-specific information safe and confidential. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, privacy rule, took effect in 2003. It establishes a baseline of acceptable protection for patient privacy and confidentiality, and was the first federal law to identify specifically protected health information, or PHI. PHI is information that relates to a person's physical or mental health, the provision of health care, or the payment for health care. It identifies the person who is the subject of the information, is created or received by an entity subject to HIPAA and is transmitted or maintained in any form. The Medicare Fraud and Abuse Amendments of 1977 and the Medicare and Medicaid Patient and Program Protection Act of 1987 are commonly known as Stark 1 and Stark 2 and they include what is known as the anti-kickback statute. A kickback, which is a form of bribery, is providing something of value to induce certain behavior on the part of the recipient. It's a form of I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. A kickback is, does not necessarily involve a person acting in an official or public capacity. Instead, it can be and often is a private citizen or corporate entity providing something of value in an effort to change the behavior of the recipient to do something in favor of the one providing the thing of value. In many cases, the valuable thing is an offer of payment in, ex in an exchange for referrals. So the Stark rules forbid organizations and providers from referring patients to themselves or to businesses in which they hold an ownership position. Anti-kickback laws were created to ensure free trade and the patient's free choice of provider. In addition, the regulation of referrals is meant to prevent the creation of closed feedback loops of referrals and services that benefit the organization or providers, but may not be in the best interest of the patient. Obtaining informed consent from the patient is the duty of the provider. Informed consent as a legal matter is an outgrowth of the ethical concept of recognizing the autonomy of each patient. At its core, it is a reflection of autonomy, respect for the person. The informed consent form is a legal document in all 50 states. It is an agreement for a proposed medical treatment or non-treatment or for a proposed invasive procedure. 
It requires physicians to disclose the benefits, risks, and alternatives to the proposed treatment, non-treatment, or procedure. Now, the, area, uh, the topic um, in the area of providers and patients in which most people are familiar is the issue of professional liability or malpractice. While tort and negligence are derived from the common law and not by legislative act, the entire concept of malpractice, which is but a species of negligence, finds its roots in the ethical precept of non-maleficence, first do no harm. Malpractice cases can arise because of alleged negligence, intentional tort, or breach of contract. The most common malpractice cases stem from negligence. Seldom do physicians commit an intentional tort to injure a patient. Negligence has four elements that must be proven. One, that the provider had duty of due care. Two, that the provider breached that duty. Three, that the provider's breach of duty was the direct cause of the injury. And four, that the injury resulted in damages to the patient. We live in a litigious society and healthcare managers must understand professional liability and the need to be proactive in the creation and implementation of workable and efficient incident reporting systems. Any unusual or potentially problematic event, medical or interpersonal, between a provider or staff member and a patient should be reported and reviewed by the medical director and the staff member's manager, the human resource office, and as needed by legal counsel. The precept of respect for the person is not limited to the healthcare organization's relationship to the patient. We most commonly think of it in those terms because of the potential for abuse of patients who are, by, ne by definition, vulnerable because of their physical condition. But healthcare organizations must also be respectful of the person in other categories of relationships. Healthcare organizations are labor intensive and often one of the largest employers in a geographic area. They also employ a range of healthcare professionals and other workers and are subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which ensures all employees access to a minimum wage, overtime pay, and equal pay for equal work, and places restrictions on child labor. The federal government has passed anti-discrimination laws to ensure equal employment opportunities to all qualified workers. The five primary statutes in this area are the following. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which bars discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, natural origin, or pregnancy. Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which bars discrimination against persons with physical disabilities. Age Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967, bars discrimination against persons older than age 40. Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, protects individuals with disabilities and requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations. In the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, it requires employers with 50 or more employees to provide eligible employees up to 12 weeks per year of unpaid leave and continued health insurance coverage. In conclusion, our Western ethical precepts are the foundation for professional ethics to clinicians, professional ethics for managers, which include excellence in patient care, respect for employees, corporate citizenship, and good stewardship of resources.